Good morning. What a thrill to be with you all. Happy birthday, Reach Out and Read. And I'm delighted to be a part of the birthday party um, that we're all gathered at. And I'm especially honored to be asked to, to talk to you about uh, what has been a lifetime passion about working on promoting relational health into our space of prevention in all we do within pediatrics. And there's no better platform than, of course, Reach Out and Read and its role within primary care pediatrics as being a champion of strengthening relationships in order to make profound differences for children and families. I think the theme for Chapter 2 of Reach Out and Read I'm wanting to bring to you is promoting relational health. And I'm purposely saying it in this way about relational health because of what Andy was alluding to which is um, changing and shifting cultural norms. And really, I'm hoping to leave with you the sense that carrying the message of strengthening relational health is a key cultural norm that we've got to be intentional about messaging in all things we do. The second thing I would say is I think it's essential that we hold on to keeping relationships centered in everything we think about. We live in a culture of individuals. We've all been built and developed in a way of thinking individually. But to build health and development and well-being and to counter the major challenges we have now in public health in terms of social well-being and preventative mental health, we've got to shift the lens of our thinking into a clear relational focus in all things we do. It's a slippery slope. And unless you keep relationships at the center of your thinking, we can all slide away from what's the driver of building health and development that we now so keenly know about. I'm really excited, too, to think with you. There's sort of a celebration also for a reunion of our Early Brain and Child Development Task Force of the AAP. We're all here. Pam High, Andy, Depeche, um, Fan Tate, uh, myself. Colleen Craft's not here, but she's in memory in my thinking. And she said at our meeting, now 10 years ago, and that was that relationships are a vital sign in pediatrics. I've never forgotten that. But how do we operationalize that in our work? How do we capture that kind of thinking in how we do our work in our day-to-day -day lives? Um, and so in the 10 years since the early brain and child development work of the academy came out and the task force, I mean, and the whole movement about early brain and child development is really striking. And we've known now so much from Jack Shankoff's work and the like about the, power, the importance of building brain architecture. We know about the ACEs work. The, we know about the epigenetic transformation work. We know about brain plasticity. We know about the healing and resiliency of relationships. But we talk about children develop critically within the environment of relationships. And I would suggest to you we've not made as much progress in the last decade around that issue about promoting and strengthening the relational context in all things we do within primary care and also more deeply into the early care and education community. I think that's in front of us. The other part that was striking to me as I journeyed from working at HRSA and home visiting early childhood systems, which is a fabulous program of home visiting but touches only three to five percent of need. They are focused relationally but it's only a small lever. We're right back to the medical home and the community being the place where we touch larger populations because we have an epidemic of social emotional weaknesses of kids, the kindergarten readiness challenge that we're all facing, and also, if you've been watching the, the, the data that's coming out in epidemiological efforts about the mental health epidemics that are also growing in terms of anxiety and depression of, uh, across socioeconomically, as well as the suicide epidemic. These are the challenges of the culture of isolation. These are the challenges that I think that we're likewise being really called out to embrace as being really critical and important. Now, I also, over the last period, and I think we have to be very clear, it all, the relationship and development of health happens so very early. The neuroscience and the neurodevelopmental data is compelling about how early in building the social brain, the experiences matter. In a culture that forgets about babies, 
I've been struck we're doing, a, I will mention later, a frameworks analysis, framework study, and they're doing focus groups with pediatricians, with parent focus groups, and with early care and education groups. And we're now in three, three communities doing that kind of work. And with one of the most striking observations of these focus group discussions about early relational health is that these groups have a very hard time talking about babies. They tend to talk about preschoolers. Culturally speaking, it's hard for us to embrace the earliness and the criticalness of keeping our eye on a baby's future starts relationally. How do we elevate that visibly? We know that in pediatrics, but our parents may not necessarily know that we care about that. And our early care and education community is struggling about how do they serve ever more effectively um, young families, especially around babies. The other striking element that I think is part of your work of thinking about chapter two is the urgency question. And certainly internationally, there's a strong movement, of course, in focusing on human well-being and in terms of the sustainable development goals. Many countries are moving forward rapidly in terms of really looking at how do they embrace a transformational challenge for um, building human well-being. And one of the key elements is caregive, responsive caregiving as being a key element. I would say we're behind in terms of thinking about strengthening the relational context. Our field of infant mental health and mental health is not going to be able to do it simply because we don't have a workforce that's really invested in or developed. And we're, it falls to us as a health system, a public health system, and in our many, many partnerships who are focused on exactly the same work in early childhood communities to really envision our chapter two activities moving forward. Now, I want, when we start talking about early relational health, the next question that comes up is, what are we talking about? Or what does it look like? In some of the focus groups we had with pediatricians around relational health and what it means to them is, um, concept makes sense, but what does it look like? And then what do we do? So I want you to first embrace and think about what does it look like? Can we, we're going to share the first video, is this possible? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> okay. Let's pause. Engagement and emotional connections are central. Secure, positive, nurturing, stimulating environments are, and you're observing it, you're resonating with it, you in a very brief, quick moment know that the relational context is strong, you can see it, you can feel it, you can know it, it's measurable, you can document it, and you can address it. The next one, please. They need to work on that, right? Viral yes. sensation. Did you understand it though? Yeah. No. Okay. Uh -huh. Oh, no. Not, not this one. This is, this is Can you pause it for one second? Yeah. Pause it, please. Now we're laughing because it's beautiful. But secondly, it's dyadic. Thirdly, it's before language. Fourthly, there's a nonverbal continuous language. Fifthly, you see so much complexity of the interaction between them. That's the relational health space. And curiously, this, viral, this video went viral. Millions of people it got onto the news. And I've asked myself, culturally speaking, why was that? What was captured that inspired this nation? And I think, again, the the, the shift of cultural norms means that people view the criticalness of relationships as being really a part of what's moving forward. Next, can I have the next slide, please? So you're looking at relational health. But we in child health care can see variations of that. Can we show the first one of Chase and his parents, please? We can observe relational health in the waiting room. Uh, 
And that little skill of imitation tells you tremendous things about <laughs> cognitive development, tells you that no. about the social engagement, it tells you this child does not have autism. Mm -hmm. It tells you so many pieces of information in the relational context of what you're observing in a brief few moments. Okay, the next one, please. For Ella and her mom, please. We can stop. So in a very brief moment, you have a different experience. You immediately start asking yourself internally a series of questions. Before long, you're going to think about, what am I going to say? But you've observed a series of interactive patterns that raise for you questions, and you're comparing it to a norm that you have in your mind of what you expect to see in relational health. This is the observational space. Also, that we're talking about a relational health May I speak, see Donnie and his mom, please? Can you do this? Look, look, kid, look. Yellow. Look, look at my blue. Orange. Here, hold on. Wait, here. Can you do it with mommy? Look, look, look. Yellow, no, look, look. Okay, well, sometimes you go, oh my. <laughs> but you find yourself again as you're observing relational patterns and relational health wanting to do something. That's the space of relational health that matters and that we're trying to more increasingly define. There is a literature about relational health that comes in the, it's in the adult literature, it's in the women's studies literature, it's in the college literature. There's very little about early relational health as a literature, as a discussion point, but we're trying to define it as the positive and stimulating and nurturing early relationships that ensure emotional security and connections that serve as the foundation for physical, uh, developmental, and social well-being and resiliency. But there's also relational health care. So there's relational health, then there's relational health care. And in relational health care, certainly Reach Out and Read is part of that work. And there are other elements within that space that are really important. This concept of relational health is trying to create a, the sense of continuum, but most importantly, to be thinking about promotion and prevention, and that that's a part of the primary care critical role that we really play. Our colleagues in infant mental health have a field that they've been building. It's basically been built by white women. It's a very small field, and it takes a very long time of treatment. It's sort of like our neurosurgeons, of infant mental health that do that kind of work. There's a field of treatment and that has good evidence. But how do we take the knowledge of that work and not just co-locate it within our medical home, but actually integrate it into the way that promotion activities move forward within the pediatric space? So when we talk about early relational health, as Andy would say, it's dyadically focused. Um, it's bi-directional. You know, infants shape parents too as does the dyadic pattern of children shape parents, but parents shape children. And it's a dyadic process. In fact, there's some emerging work that says strong relational patterns actually heal mother's trauma experiences and help their well-being if they're supported by others around them as to their strengths. So that the dyadic relational patterns have a healing force bi-directionally that we really have to capture and really build on. Um, I would say early relational health is also foundational to equity because in the equity sphere, it's the relational resiliency and the social supports around it that even in communities that are marginalized, there is resiliency strength to be built on. So addressing some of the equity issue can also be addressed by thinking deeply relationally. I would also suggest that this is all deeply scientist, scientifically based now and strength-based and family-centric. And as we think about relational health, this is not about finding another way for families to fail. This is about leaning on their strengths and their resiliency and their hopes and their possibilities with a positive frame by the social context of countering isolation. 
It's also, we're talking about trying to build a, a, a framework that is really um, embraces the work we know in terms of building social emotional competencies. It's intentionally meant to be strength-based for the first thousand days. But it's not about one program. It really is about an all-in strategy. If you keep your eyes on the ball of building strong relationships in all things we do, especially early, then it's an all-in strategy that is not only us within the health system, but also the communities around us, as well as educating and communicating with parents about the criticalness of their early relationships, the early care and education community and the like. It's an all-in strategy and as well as to build a shifting of the cultural norm that's relationally centric to what babies and young infants and young toddlers really need to build their effort. And there's where policy leverage starts to have some power. Because unless we begin to keep pushing on public will about the criticalness of the early relationship patterns, and then it's an all-in, all-communicating strategy, then perhaps we can begin to move some of the policy strategies in front of us. But we're already doing early relational health work. Reach Out and Read is in that space. You've been um, working dramatically about promoting the literacy space about strengthening and strong relationships. And we have many people in this room that have been working on relational health promotion efforts, be that by um, the Video Interaction Project that, Ann, uh, that Ellen's been working on, um, Kate Rosenblum working on the early relational screen, and video feedback within the medical home. We have Martha Welsh's work with the WEX that's really in the ascendancy and practices in terms of really strengthening the relational context right in the center of primary care practices. The platforms of Dulce and Healthy Steps are actually platforms with the expanded medical home of a team-based care model. That's a platform upon which relational health, reach out and read partnership, and the like can really start building out an intentional transformation of pediatric practice towards a relational health focused efforts in our promotion strategy over time. And I think it's a really unique opportunity in front of us. But it also requires us looking outside of our medical home to our communities and partnering with the other elements of system building that really care about exactly the same effort. And the efforts in the place-based communities that are working hard within the early childhood um, the EC Link communities of CSSP, or the Strive Together communities, or the, um, the NCIT community work, the whole community, early childhood birth the three community strategy development that's going on in every state is likewise thinking relationally. And their desire to partner ever more strongly with the medical home in exactly the same kind of direction. This all-in strategy between systems and transforming our system, our role as a pediatrician saying, we can help set those foundations to get the dialogues going. We can link you with community supports intentionally. Those kind of efforts are really moving. And I would argue that that's a relational health frame of rebuilding, recapturing the social networks and supports that are really essential to building well-being. Next slide, observation one. Bob Nadelman shared with me. Go for it. His use of video within relational health, within Reach Out and Read. You can pause. You all see this every day. But how can you objectify it even to the next level relationally? And can you use video feedback to parents, which in the field of infant mental health, video feedback and reflective practice is probably one of the most powerful levers in infant mental health. Reflective video feedback as an intervention strategy and is a possibility and an option to think about partnerships and new directions to think of moving forward on your reach on read platform. Next observation, please. And then you see variations through the reach out and read lens. <laughs> you can stop now. You see variations through the reach out and read lens that can cause you to create an intervention strategy 
because you begin to observe what characteristics were missing, not strong. You've objectified what your contributions are going to be. But you could use video feedback as a way to contribute to the next level of strengthening the, the work of, uh, that we already have in place. I think we have some guidance also for your chapter two work that's coming out of CSST's most recent report for the PSP effort. I hope you've all had a chance to look at the, the report that just came out from the Pediatric Supporting Parents Initiative, looking at the 14 different models, many of whom are in this room, and what are the key characteristics that we can use to promote social emotional development within the pediatric platform, which I think is thrilling. And Reach on Read is well represented in that space. But if you start looking at what's the next effort that we can, if we start thinking of chapter two and then moving it towards chapter three, what do we add with our Reach on Read space that we've learned from the observations and the feedback of parents and of pediatricians about the levers of these practices that are promoting social emotional development in the medical home? And a few of those elements are one, of course, we're nurturing parent competencies and confidence, is straight face observations, feedback, um, enhancing anticipatory guidance material, and parent co and, and, and partnering with parents to co-create the, the goals. Secondly, the call out of the, these major elements of promotion social emotional development through the pediatric practice also calls out to link with communities and to know your resources deeply and to be not thinking solely as one model but as part of a linking, coordinating effort with this, the activities and services going on in communities. And then thirdly, it was about thinking broadly towards a team-based care model. And I think about that as an all-in strategy, which is not one model, but actually building together with the teams, many of whom are in this room, about the power of Reach and Read with the partnership of the expanding team-based care model in coordination with community supports and systems in order to be able to play our role within a broadening population and community-based strategy of building well-being. Putting a relational lens in that space, I think, is in front of us and a great opportunity. So fi fi finally, um, I'm thrilled to be working at CSSP around trying to advance the relational health frame. And then the question of how do we move this ever further? Reach out and read and other efforts can be part of that work. We're doing a framework study within the, um, as, in terms of the messaging strategy, and a couple of things have been really striking. I've mentioned to you that uh, one of the findings was that um, the, the, it's hard for these communities, parents and early caring educators, to talk about um, babies. They tend to talk about older children. And I think that's important that we keep talking about the relational context of babies is really, really important. But the other a surprising observation in the first level of the framework study was that the early care and education frontline providers and parents did not understand how pediatricians could be, play a role in strengthening and supporting their early relationships. That's striking to me, how we could better communicate as a pediatric community. Our commitment to strengthening relationships moving forward becomes really essential. So we're working in deeply in communities. We're exploring with some communities about bringing an all-in strategy of relational health over all the systems effort moving forward. If I had my wish, Reach on and Read Chapter 2 would focus about trying to bring a scaling um, into place-based communities, an all-in strategy where all pediatricians in a well-organized early childhood community did Reach on and Read as a part of a population post effort right, so that one has a saturation in a community as they're measuring um, practices over change. So all of this is about, you've got a dream about where we're trying to move forward. I think that focusing intently on the power of connections and bringing that into the work that we do every day and thinking about that as a relational health frame transformation of our work and chapter two of Reach on and Read can be a, a, a huge and important contributor to that kind of effort moving forward. So happy birthday, Reach on and Read. I'm glad to be a part of the conversation. Thanks.